It's all right by me. That's all right by me. And uh, tonight we are wanting to talk about something that is rarely talked about in churches in general around the world, actually, of all denominations and, uh, and types. Something that as a congregation, as con congregations of the churches of Christ, historically we haven't talked about a great deal. And I doubt that that's uh, different here in Thames Valley. And what we want to do tonight is to bring together the spiritual perspective on emotional and mental health, Amen. together with biblical perspectives on how we handle our challenges in the area of emotional well-being and uh, mental well-being, and how we relate to and help other people who are going through those challenges, friends, family, whoever we happen to know. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a critical, <coughs> crucial topic. Yeah. Uh, for us today. So we've entitled, and because we want to talk about this, for, because we have a lot of, have some experience and also um, I, quite a lot of conviction about this area. And obviously Penny with her background as a doctor, as a GP, as someone who knows, who knows more about these issues medically than uh, the vast majority of church members has a particular helpful perspective to bring. So she's going to be sharing quite a lot tonight. We've entitled it, I will hope in your name. From Psalm 52 verse 9, I will hope in your name. And the reason we chose that phrase from that psalm is that a lot of time we end up, we hope in something that is insubstantial or cannot be reliable. We hope about we hope that God will give us good health. We hope that God will give us a, a, a happy marriage. We hope that God will see our children become Christians. We hope that life will turn out well. And we even hope that God will do these things for us. And sometimes it's God's will and it works out that way. But in the end, the only, re only thing we can healthily have hope in is in His name, meaning who He is. Because that's what God's talking about when he talks about his name. It's fundamentally who he is. And so we're going to be exploring this tonight. The clinical and spiritual perspective on depression. If I, you could just give me that next slide. Here's, that's the, um, uh, uh, from Job chapter 10 verse 18 here. Uh, we may well have felt this from time to time. Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah. I mean, haven't we all the times? Why God? Why have you brought me into this world? And we, we've got to deal with something the Bible does deal with, which is the, the sense of despair and deep anxiety and depression from time to time. Now, this is a huge topic. So tonight, all we're going to deal with is principles of how we deal with this kind of stuff, and specifically the issue of depression. Uh, we'd like to talk about anxiety, specifically, and some other things, but we just have, don't have time in one class. So tonight, we're just going to focus on the issue of depression. The cl clarifying it by definition, exploring the significant, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the frequency of, of its occurrence in the population and in church, <coughs> We're going to be talking a little bit about experiences of depression and how we can be empathic towards people, potential treatments for depression, and some personal sharing from ourselves, and some tips for, to help us with helping ourselves, but also uh, other people. But I'm going to uh, now give up this spot to Penny, and she'll be sharing for a good while. And at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you have some questions, please note them down, and uh, we'll do our best to answer some of those questions at that time. So. Come on, Penny. Come on, Penny. So we're going to become experts. <laughs> Teach undergraduate medical students, postgraduate medical students, all this stuff. So you're going to be experts. Um, if, if we go away from tonight with one thing in our head, I want it to be the figure one in four. Okay. According to the world. 
health organisation, the proportion of those of us of working age who in any given year will have some mental health challenge is one in four. That's a huge number of people. And some of, the, some of the time it's us, some of the time it's our family, the people that we love, the people that we work with, our neighbours. And I really think that it's good for us to know something about mental health. Amen. Depression, and specifically anxiety and depression together, is the commonest mental health problem. And probably, if you did a pie chart of all the types of mental health challenges, depression and anxiety is about two thirds. It's a big chunk. And about a third would be depression, um, about two thirds is depression and anxiety, and then there's other things in there. So that's why we picked this tonight, because it is really common. But if you can remember that idea, that concept, that one in four of us will have some struggles every year during our working age, then, then I will have succeeded. <laughs> because there is a stigma. I was talking with somebody recently who said, uh, you know, I got really down in the dumps so about this that, but I wasn't depressed. <laughs> and of course, none of us wants to ever think that we might be depressed. But we say something like that because there's a stigma. Mm -hmm. yeah. And equally in society, as in the church, because of course in the church we have the Holy Spirit, and we're supposed to be able to repent of discouragement. <laughs> and pull ourselves together and, you know, yeah. get fired up. So, you know, unfortunately it doesn't always work like that. Um, yeah. But there is a stigma, and I think there are, there are different reasons, even within the church, for why sometimes these things can affect us. Uh, but it is certainly a very common thing. So, okay, we're gonna, the, the, the most important thing about the kinds of symptoms that somebody might experience is that to be diagnosed, sort of efficiently uh, with depression, you need to have had disabling symptoms for at least a couple of weeks. So we all have a bad day now and again when we might feel any or all of these symptoms, or we might even have a bad week. But when it's gone for a couple of weeks and it's not going away, it's with us every day, week in, week out, then we start to say that this is depression. And. Um, there, there's two sets of symptoms. There's, there's core symptoms and then there's um, other general symptoms. And these are the two main core symptoms and you will have one or both of these. Um, feeling sad, you know, feeling low. We all have days when we feel discouraged, <coughs> but you're feeling that nearly every day. And then the other thing is loss of interest or pleasure in most activities. So all the things that you normally love the things that you normally look forward to, your favourite newspaper, your walk with the dog, your chat with a friend, you've just lost the interest in them. With the technical term is anhedonia. Um, I'm just actually curious before I go on, do we have, we have counsellors here? Any, anybody with experience um, of, of working in this field? Um, anybody else? <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, okay, the second, so, so you would have at least one of these, and then the second slide. Um, so fatigue or loss of energy, um, worthlessness, excessive or inappropriate guilt. That, that's quite a big deal, is you feel really negative about yourself. And as Christians, we, we, we are the kinds of people who we tend to have quite soft consciences. We wouldn't have become Christians in the first place mm. if we didn't, if we weren't able to feel bad about some of the things that we've done. But we can see Christians really plagued, feeling terribly guilty, finding it very hard to forgive themselves for the things that they've done uh, wrong. And sometimes we think that's just being good-hearted, but it can be excessive and severe. Um, thoughts about ending our life or wishing that we were dead. Um, diminished ability to think, concentrate, or increase indecision. That often older people think that they might be getting dementia uh, because they can't remember things as well as they used to. And one of the first things that we look for 
in older people with memory problems actually is whether they might be depressed. Um, because the good news is the memory gets better as the depression lifts. But, but forgetfulness, um, in a, um, it's struggling. This is where things you get, get into trouble at work because you've you've left things undone or not done thoroughly or properly, and it's because your concentration is just not there. Um, psychomotor agitation, that sort of pacing up and down, wringing your hands. Um, unable to settle, um, or retardation, where they, where people just become very, it's the complete opposite. Um, it, just no energy, and, and any kind of effort or movement is, is very difficult. Uh, not sleeping, or sleeping too much, not eating, or, or eating uh, too much. So th those would be the other sort of main symptoms that we look for. And if you've ever been down in the dumps and you've seen a doctor, then <coughs> these will be the kinds of questions they will have been asking you about. Um, you might not have realised it, but this is what they will have been uh, talking to. Um, we also say that they shouldn't be due to a physical or organic factor. Some of us have major physical illnesses, um, and that in itself can bring on depression. Um, and also drugs and alcohol. Uh, alcohol's a real downer. Um, so we, we wouldn't diagnose depression in somebody who has an alcohol problem. It, we can try and tease them apart. Um, and to a certain extent, many of us might feel these on a day to day basis, on a regular basis even. But if it's that severe that you can't do your work properly, you can't function as a mummy that's when we realise that this is not a good place to be and we need to do something about it. Um, and often symptoms are worse in the morning. So you might feel dreadful when you first wake up, but as the day progresses, you can feel quite different. And in fact, sometimes by four o'clock in the afternoon, you might not recognise the person that you were at 9am. It really is quite surreal. Uh, and we call that a diurnal variation. And as the depression lifts, that time rolls back until you're a bit more normal by coffee time instead of it taking till tea time. Um, so, I, so that's the sort of the technical perspective, and that's what, as doctors, we're looking for. I've got some accounts um, by people who are going through depression, which, if you've never been there, can be really difficult to imagine what it's like. Um, and so we're both going to read through some accounts. And these are taken from a non-Christian website uh, called Wing of Madness. If you ever, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an American user forum uh, for people with depression. And, uh, and people post there. And, and, and you realize a lot of the difficulty people are facing when you read their comments. All right, this is one that was posted. Uh, this person said, I kept going to the doctor thinking that I was sick, and as soon as my physical body was healed, my mental symptoms would be cured. All the while, I never complained of a single, men single mental symptom. My depression feels like I'm being suffocated, like there's an anvil on my chest that won't go away. Nothing has a point or meaning anymore. Such a feeling of insignificance, dirtiness, like I'm not even a person anymore. All I want to do is cry, but I don't feel as though there are any more tears left. Another person posted, I worried about the stigma associated with it. I couldn't leave the couch. I ache all over, and it's so hard to feel happy about anything. In my worst days, I can hardly wake up, and I go through the day in a complete fog. I'd frequently get bad stomach pains. I think I was the most horrible person in the world. And my therapist would ask me, what have I ever done that would make me think, make me think that? I sat there blank. I had no idea, but the feelings were very real and very scary. Um, this is a bit from a, a book. When I, I've written a chapter in a women's ministry handbook on uh, mental health, and I asked church members I knew who had had struggles to t tell me what their experience was. And so this is from a girl who uh, was a member of the church. 
My mind was and remains the site of many exhausting battles, with scriptures constantly running wild in my head, rebuking my anxieties and downcast state over the years. The eventual cycle of anxiety and guilt for being so anxious and depressed left me feeling even more discouraged and exhausted. I often felt that my heart must be hard for scripture to have so little effect on me. I battled on for years as I came to believe that surely if I prayed more or had more faith, I should not have to resort to antidepressants since the word was living and active. Yet I was unable to overcome. Years later, after going on to antidepressants, I was advised to see a psychiatrist in an attempt to understand and treat my constant exhaustion. He helped me gain insight into the physically exhausting nature of my now entrenched anxiety guilt cycles and the resultant depression with this simple analogy. It's like jogging on the spot. Years of jogging on the spot have left me extremely exhausted, but God is kind. He's put gracious people in my life as well as various books which challenge my downward spiraling thoughts that were strongly associated with scripture and is slowly giving me hope anew. Think a bit about Bible characters. Can you think of any of the uh, characters from the Bible who you think might have been depressed? King Saul. Elijah. Saul. King Saul, we are. Elijah. David. Elijah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. The weeping prophet. There's a clue. Job. <laughs> Job. Jesus. <laughs> you know, I mean, you see these cries of desperate, especially before the cross, when Jesus is really, yeah, absolutely. Jonah. 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 I mean, obviously, we didn't have technical <laughs> diagnosis of depression back then, but we know that people suffered from similar conditions, and there were some really ancient writings that back that up. But I, I do think that a lot of the Bible characters at some stage would have, have uh, felt that way. Um, okay, what, what gets us there? What, what leads to all of this happening? Um, so the short version is, we think there were three areas that work together. Family background, there is, a, there is an inheritable uh, tendency. The personality, which is slightly different, but the kind of person you are. So for example, perfectionists, if we have a very perfectionist um, mindset, that's a, a risk factor. And then circumstances. So whatever's going on in life, you might be coping fine for years, but then um, when things start to go wrong, um, things start to fall apart, like losing your place. I've <laughs> 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 done that one. <laughs> no, that's the back page. I've done that one. That's what you can do. Okay, just going back on, on uh, personality a bit. If you think about it, we, we readily accept that some of us are perhaps creative in our nature, or very intellectual, or diligent, um, that you know, these are personality traits. But what about a tendency to be melancholic, to be sad? You know, we wouldn't tell somebody to repent of their creativity. Yeah. Although creativity might get in the way of learning maths or something, and you learn to manage it. But in, in the same way, those of us who perhaps have a depressive personality can learn to manage that side of our character. Uh, and under circumstances, it, it, not so much short crises, um, that could be dealt with like dealing with a load of laundry, but the longer term problems, uh, relationships, uh, finances, illness, uh, work issues, our ch how our children are getting on, and, and often the sense of being trapped, that seems to be um, a clear precipitant where you're stuck in a situation that there's no way out. Um, a lot of the early research on depression uh, using animal studies identified that, that 
being trapped is a big problem. Um, and I, I'm, just to share a little bit personally here, I think, I think my own challenges with this, uh, for various reasons over the years, um, I think I'm probably a bit depressive in my personality. I'm a sort of Eeyore character by nature. <laughs> I work in a field where I'm dealing with yeah. everybody else's crises all the time, and um, and I and I found things extremely challenging. For example, a couple of years ago, when both of our children were in a very difficult place in life, and trying uh, to wrestle with that, um, you know, having really believed almost <coughs> simplistically in the church for many many years, you know, you go to the parenting classes do this, you do that, you do the other, and your children should blossom <laughs> in their life and spiritually. And actually realising that it just hasn't worked in this case. And so there's a cycle of guilt and self-examination and worry uh, about what might happen. Um, I found that extremely difficult. And uh, I remember sharing with Jemima Rowden, you know, Paul and Jemima are elders in the East Ministry of the London Church. And she challenged me because she felt, she, she said to me, you seem to have really lost hope. And I was a bit ticked off at the time, I didn't agree with her. But she was right. Uh, and, and I could see that at that point I had just lost all hope and I was in a very sort of despairing place. Um, I, I, I do think that there's sort of a somewhat black and white view uh, of the gospel and you know, we, we talk about not having a health or wealth gospel in church. We don't tell people that God wants you to be rich and have a fleet of Mercedes. But I do think sometimes we, we like to buy into the, you might have the perfect family if you do everything right. And that, that was something for me that I, I had to sort of really wrestle with. Uh, even nowadays, you, you know, you read the newspaper and you read the science section and it will tell you that all the latest scientific advances, we've, 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 got, we've got theories for everything now and how to avoid everything or make things happen. Uh, I was, um, I listened to a talk where a sister was, uh, by, by, uh, by somebody recently where she challenged somebody um, a single sister in her 30s to uh, believe that in the next fortnight in her evangelism she would meet a bloke who would become a Christian uh, and then they would get married within the next 12 months. <laughs> and actually I have to say it made me furious. <laughs> because, do you know what, it, it, I think for, you know, depending on the kind of person you are, that kind of goal could really, really help you. But for other people, yeah. I mean, you might as well buy a lottery ticket. I just thought you set yourself up to be, to be let down. And, we, and it's like God becomes some sort of a charm bracelet. Um, and, and we don't do God any favour or ourselves when we set ourselves up in that way. Um, and then one of the, so I think one of the pieces of work that I had to do for myself was to completely re-examine my relationship with God and what I understood about God. Um, okay, I'm going to pull us back onto uh, treatments. Okay, um, the technical stuff. If you if you have a bout of depression, it will probably last six to twelve months, average eight months. It's, it's not fixed quickly. It will become a big part of your life. Um, we, we have, there are people who think that Christians should never need medication, never need treatment. I think we're probably changing a bit in church on that. But certainly, you know, you would take some paracetamol for a headache, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, paracetamol doesn't affect that bit of you that's hurting. It works on your perception of pain in your brain. Or epilepsy. You know, we would give somebody medication for epilepsy oh, yeah. because the brain is too energetic in specific parts. Well, why wouldn't we give somebody medication for depression if we think that they might benefit from it? Yeah. We think generally only, only moderate or severe cases of depression benefit from medication. The milder versions, and there is no benefit from medication. 
Um, exercise, we know exercise is very valuable. Yeah. Um, if you're feeling depressed, it can be jolly hard to get on a bike or go for a run. <laughs> um, but sometimes if you're bad enough that you need medication, medication sort of helps scrape you off the floor so that you can then get on a bicycle or do something to get the, uh, the natural endorphins going. And I think the talking therapies are really, really important. Yeah. Um, not when you're absolutely in the pits, because it can be very difficult to engage with a therapist at that time, but when you're sort of off the bottom and you're beginning to get insight into what might be going on, then the talking therapy is really, really valuable. And I think it's very important that if we think we, or somebody that we care about, is becoming depressed, that we, we send them to help. Yeah. We send them to where they can get some help, but we don't try with the gospel of ourselves to fix people. I think we can be really helpful by signposting people. And most medical professionals now are very sympathetic towards faith uh, and see it as a really important of part of holistic care to, to pay attention to that. Right. Um, Okay, well that, that was a sort of an emerging slide that shows how things can sort of, you know, the, you end up with the perfect storm in the middle of things going wrong. Right, I'm going to get Malcolm to read next. Which bit do you want? Yeah. Um, the Book of Job quote? Yeah. In the book? Yeah. Do you want to explain it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a doctor um, writing uh, about the Book of Job, actually, um, in uh, Medical Classics, uh, back in 2007, there's a chapter called Loud. Lo and by the way, all the slides will be online, we'll put them on the, um, on the website, a link from the Facebook page. So. Um, he says this about Job, enter God in a whirlwind. In three chapters of terrifying poetic power, God makes no apologies, no excuses for himself. Instead. He describes creation in all its beauty, its cruelty, and its utter unfathomability. That's a good word. Yeah. Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? Her young ones also suck up blood. And where the slain are, there is she. Uh, we are no longer in the world of infantile religion or naive therapy for the survivors of trauma. The grand vista of nature opens before Job and it reveals the working of God in a realm other than man's moral order. And uh, do you want to read the rest of that? A Catholic priest once described how he had to perform the funeral of a small child. And there's only one way that it was possible for him to do it with any degree of honesty or authenticity to offer no explanations, no pretense of understanding, no defense of his faith. Good doctors and good counselors do likewise. The God of the book of Job is not the reasonable, bland God of wishful liberals, nor the vengeful and punishing God of fundamentalists. He is as he is. That is what makes this book, the book of Job, possibly the most challenging in the whole Bible, and the most enduring handbook for any of us who have to deal professionally with tragedy, loss, and despair. It was a great bit of writing. Yeah. I uh, am conscious of the time, and we'll want to have a bit of time for Q&A at yeah. the end. Right. I, I think Malcolm shared last week about how wherever it hurts, that's where we go to God to study and learn. And if this is something that you have battled with, or somebody you care about has battled with, then study it out. And the last couple of slides are some resources, um, some websites and some books which uh, can be helpful. There's lots of great material out there now. Uh, in the last few years there's been a real sort of awakening uh, about this and I would encourage you to pursue it further um, to help you um, plow through it with God and be healed. Yeah, and of course you do need to uh, see your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
Can I just say one thing? Is if you're struggling with some of this stuff, can I encourage you not to make a cue to my wife? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it, because sometimes they can be a little overwhelming, and uh, you might want to see your own doctor. Okay. Uh, but anyway, um, Q and A. Yeah, I mean, questions. Um, I'll have a little summary here in a moment when we finish at the very end. But what comes to mind? Questions, comments, uh, anything you want to ask about? Uh, yeah, Karen. Um, I just wondered if I, I sort of had a question after I had Zach, and it's, it was funny to see all the different things that make it happen. But so, if you take medication, what does it actually do? Because I thought it was something to do with a, a hormone imbalance. So you take the medication, it balances your hormone to make you think well enough. Is that in every case? Um, yeah, it, it, so we think that we've become depleted in a number of hormones, but predominantly serotonin, uh, which is a chemical in the brain um, associated with happiness, and we think levels of that drop. We don't know all of the reasons why, but antidepressants work to lift those levels. They don't solve any of the other problems going on. They don't deal with the hormonal crash that you get after delivering a baby, which we think is related to postnatal depression. But they can get you into a place where you can sort of confront and begin to deal with the issues. So I think it would be fair to say, as a summary, that the medication doesn't cure, but it, it enables one to get into a place where uh, a cure could become effective through other things. Yeah. Is that right? Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, Rudy. Do you have any uh, good resources for, for people to help? loved ones or people they know that suffer from depression? Um, yeah, the MIND website, um, MIND is a national charity, a mental health charity, and they have really good information about helping people. Uh, they have some leaflets that you can just download. Um, if you just Google MIND, you'll get it. I also know that uh, patient.co.uk um, also has great uh, information as well. You just put depression or whatever the mental health conditions are into the, the search bit. Yeah. Sorry, which, which website is that? So, um, the, 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 the first one, patient.co.uk. <coughs> That's a general yeah, right. health website with loads of information about everything, but if you, you were to put, say, depression into that, you'd get good information in mind. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Great. Um, so on this side? Yeah. Um, sorry, this is another question for you, Penny. But, um, just uh, someone uh, studying the scriptures to want to become a Christian and sort of, you know, in the middle of their journey, um, obviously finding out a lot of things about themselves and about the Bible, but having a history of depression as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any sort of advice in terms of, because now there's a sense of, great, this is a fantastic solution, I want to just get more and more of what the Bible is saying, but there's obviously me going, oh, I need to just be wary that, because this person has a history of depression. Does that make sense? So, yeah. what, what's helpful in, in having that balance when you're teaching someone the scriptures for the first time? I think I'd look for extremes. So if they're yeah. showing extreme reactions to scripture, then I'd be quite cautious, and especially issues around guilt, worthlessness, right. which again, we can begin to think, this is such a humble person. Yeah. Well, they might be, but it might be a bit pathological too. It might actually be unhealthy. Um, I mean, I'd be very, very happy uh, to talk through advice in those situations because it does vary as well depending on the mental health problems that people have had on how it's going to affect things when they study. I do think people need plenty of time and they do need to be doing lots of reading on their own, but those are things that you would generally encourage anyway. I would add to that, I think uh, anybody with a complicated, more complicated situation than most takes, you'd go slower yeah. as, an, as a general rule and, and help them to love God deeply yeah. as best you can. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question. Um, There's some great Bible studies. Sorry, one of the books. Uh, I think it might be next, next page. page. Yeah. Um, the Shapiro's. Uh, oh, yes, I know that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually got Bible studies in um, the back. Yeah. Um, for people with challenges, which are really, really great Bible studies. And they also have lots of information about surviving church when you're depressed. <laughs> 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 it's just what you say under the duvet. The thought of being in this happy, clappy environment.
experiment is anathema. It can be very difficult. Yeah. So that's a DPI book you can you can find online. Just some insights. We've talked about Job quite a lot. I mean, are there some lessons we can learn just from the way the people around him dealt with him uh, that can help us uh, when we're trying to help others. The people yeah. around him were generally very unhelpful. Well, right. yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we can learn lessons from that. Yes. I mean, that's probably a whole class. Of, but like righteous, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is unhelpful. If, you're, if someone's depressed, I, I think this is be, it's very important to distinguish between discouragement and depression. They're not the same thing. When you can be discouraged and depressed, but, uh, you, right, right, but, but they're not the same thing. And so we would approach spiritually, pastorally helping someone who's discouraged a bit differently from someone who's depressed. And if you recognize that someone's depressed or maybe, then they need to go and get some help. And maybe then they can tell us how we can be helpful to them. That's usually, I think with someone like that situation, how can I help you is better than I know how to help you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 I think some listening skills would be a really fun class for them. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Listening skills are yeah. a very important thing. Good, we've got time for maybe one more, I think. Uh, yes, Alex. Um, I was wondering about forms um, of depression that exhibit um, swings, so like not just like lows, but like strong mm. highs. Mm. Yeah. Um, and what difference was between, yeah, when, when you. Is it a depression where you feel every emotion very strongly, or is it like tends to just be sadness, or that, you know, what are the Yeah, um, the kind of depression that I've talked about tonight yeah. um, is not the same as the kind of depression you might get in bipolar disorder. Uh, bi bipolar disorder is. Uh, is, is very uncommon. Um, it can only be a few, a very few percentage of the population, and it's one of the <coughs> mental conditions where you can actually be quite delusional. Um, so, it's very severe forms of depression, you will have delusions. And I've worked with people who are convinced that they robbed a bank, um, or that they're being watched and spied on by <coughs> satellites. Um, and, and those people are very, very poorly. Um, but that's a different condition. And that's very well. It, it's, it looks like depression, but it's it's very severe. But but and that's the kind that you might get in bipolar disorder. And then people can swing from that to thinking that they're Jesus incarnate. So and we sorry, we're going to have to wrap yeah, up here. Okay. <laughs> so it it's different, but it exists. <laughs> it's really challenging. Um, we're going to, need to wrap up. I think just to go back to the title about hope, there is hope. If you're depressed, if your friends are depressed, there is absolutely hope. Uh, a couple of things that we can do is obviously pray with and for people. Another thing we can do is listen well, be a good friend, and not offer too many solutions. Um, Jesus and all of great heroes and heroines of the faith in the Bible went through tough times. So we all go through tough times, and for some of us that ends up with some bouts of depression, which Penny and I have both personally experienced. Uh, we can say that God is faithful to us through those tough times. Yeah. But we've got to have people around us who can support us in the situation we're in, not just to get us out of the situation we're in. We need the support while we're depressed, as well as uh, other things. Just to finish off with Psalm 13, we can we put it on the screen, uh, I believe it's the next slide. I love the way that David kind of coaches himself here. Let me let this be something for us all. Uh, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? <laughs> how long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? It's all up in here. He knows it is. Day after day I have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But, and that's the word I've highlighted there in a different color. That, but, uh, three letters, means so much. But, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. 
And Ace is a great sign of meditate on when you're in a tough place and, and pray over as we go through that. Let's have a prayer together and we'll have some fellowship. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together safely tonight. We pray for a safe journey home too. Thank you for your constant faithfulness to us, even through the dark times when we don't feel it, we don't sense it, and you don't seem real to us. But God, we know that though we change, and our feelings change, and our chemicals in our brain change, and things change in us, you don't change. Your name is your name. You are who you are. Help us to revere and honor you for that, and then look to you for the strength we need to get us through the difficult times. Help us to be people of love to people who go through those tough times, who are depressed. Help us to show them the love of Christ, and uh, so that maybe one day, God, they will come back to you. Lord, we're grateful for uh, your patience with us, and your mercy, and all that you've taught us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Have a great time of fellowship.